the more that we can talk about how actually let's just not forget that the EU for a start has been responsible for some of the most progressive um, social legislation in Britain. It's certainly been responsible for some of the best environmental legislation uh, in Europe. My name is Jackson, I'm with Caroline Lucas, who's a UK MP and former leader of the Green Party in the UK. Um, so yeah, I just thought I, we could start a conversation by discussing why you're here today at the DM event, um, what you hope comes out of it and what do you think the perspective of it would be? Well, thank you very much. And the reason for coming to the DM event uh, here in Berlin is essentially because I believe that if we're serious about reforming the European Union, if we're serious about ensuring that social and environmental justice are at its heart, that it's more transparent and accountable, then that movement has got to be a pan-European one. We can't do that in one single country alone. And what I find so exciting about this conference is that you have so many different perspectives from right across the EU uh, with a whole lot of new ideas about ways in which we could make the European Union more socially just, more environmentally sustainable. But it's not just about good ideas, it's actually getting to some of the strategies to bring that about as well. Um, this is, I think this is a topic that's been kind of on the minds of, of the progressive forces in Europe for quite a long time, how, how we can really come together and, and work together on these issues, particularly since, since the financial crisis and the resulting austerity measures. Um, what do you think we need to really make this work? Um, there's been lots of talk also from our side about how the role of social movements and how we can, can bring social and political movements together. Um, but what do you think is, is what do you think we need to try to actually make this a, an active force in Europe? And and what is the role of the Greens across Europe also in this? I think is another important thing to discuss. Sure. I mean, it's incredibly complex, and I think we have to start with recognising that actually many people on the left in, would perhaps also feel that the EU hasn't covered itself in glory in the mm. last few years. I mean, the way in which it's treated Greece, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership Treaty, these are sometimes put forward as arguments why progressive movements should not be supporting the mm. European Union. So I think we have to acknowledge where we're at, but I would argue very strongly that we need to challenge those views. So for example, if we're talking about TTIP, then mm. making the case that actually in our case, Britain, in fact, David Cameron has been one of the biggest cheerleaders for, for TTIP. And the idea that if we left the EU, somehow we would have a nice, benign, kind trade policy, I think is fantasy land, because mm. we know that that same investor state dispute settlement mechanism that is so hated in TTIP is already in many bilateral uh, trade agreements set up with the, uh, with the UK. So I think, first of all, we need to challenge some of the, the, the myths and the concerns, um, as well as acknowledging where they're coming from and, and seeing that but then really demonstrating that this can be a real pan-European movement for change. And, and that is what I think gives it traction, that what we're discussing here today isn't even just a set of ideas, it's a set of ideas with a timetable and, mm. and a strategy to go along with it, um, which I think makes it more tangible and, and more practical. And so I would very much hope that the environmental movements and the Occupy movements and the uh, anti-racism movements would all come together mm to recognise that actually a, a European Union that genuinely stands up for uh, the environment, for social justice, is an absolute ally in all of the battles that we're fighting, because none of them can be won in a single nation state on their own anymore. We are far too interdependent. And the environment, of course, sums that up better than most issues in the sense that pollution clearly is, is a cross-border mm -hmm. phenomenon and therefore you need cross-border policies to tackle it. So, I think that the challenge is to bring the different movements together and to demonstrate why the EU matters to their particular causes mm. and, and to add that up into, into something that, that crosses between the movements and the political parties. And that'll be a challenge for political parties too, because we have our kind of you know, set ways of doing things and, and that needs to change as well if it's going to be a genuinely grassroots movement. Yeah, well, one thing I was, I was also thinking about a lot, or I've been thinking about a lot, is the role of the refugee support movements that, yeah. that have happened across Europe and, and kind of the apolitical or not, not, not overtly political role they've played um, in terms of transforming the, the, the solidarity and the help that they've, support, that, that, they've, that they've done into calls for political change. Mm. And on questions like this I wonder how we can, also coming from a civil society perspective or social movement perspective, how can we mobilise these people, I mean, that obviously are critical of the way things are being done and willing to help those in need um, into some of the changes also we want to see at the European mm. level. 
I'm not entirely sure what the answer is, but it's a very good question. <laughs> um, I mean, I, and I think, as you say, that outpouring of, of compassion and, and a sense of justice and that sense that, you know, that could be us and perhaps was our grandparents in the, in the past, that, that sense, I think, is something that we really need to tap into and to mm. appreciate, but also to harness in terms of, of being able to link that to the political changes that, that, that need to come about. I mean, the people that I speak to in Brighton and in other places where, where I travel, people are, are genuinely shocked at the actions of, of governments, that they can yeah. be quite so lacking in, 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 in humanity, essentially. And they point to historical moments in the past where, we, where, where in our case, Britain has actually stepped up to the plate and has been far more uh, open-minded and open-hearted than governments are being now. And I suppose that points to the fact that the people are in many senses ahead of where some of the politicians are. So if we can begin to drag the politicians with us and show that there is actually um, you know, a groundswell of, of, of people wanting to see better change and, and, and better policies in this area, perhaps it would give those politicians a little bit more, a little more stomach and a little bit more spine and backbone to, 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 to actually take on these, these issues. But it is complex. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and, and some of the people that are involved in those refugee movements perhaps don't want to be involved in, in yeah. the politics of it. But it seems to me that just their very demonstration of what they're doing in their daily lives, the way they're making those changes and helping people and working with others, is in itself, I think, a kind of a political signal to governments. Mm, yeah. Um, no, totally right. I think I think that's it's, it's, it's a difficult question, and it's definitely one that I also, we don't also don't have yeah. an answer to. But I think it's it's definitely one that's very present. I think in, in lots of people's minds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe moving away from, or may, maybe moving towards towards the UK, which is where we're both from. Um, a question I think that I've been struggling with personally, and I think many others, is also, of course, the upcoming UK referendum on membership of the EU and how to talk about. Europe as a positive force without um, without endorsing David Cameron's st strategy for, for reform of the EU. And I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on how we do this and also on how we, not only how we, we talk about this, but how we encourage others who mm. are pro-European but have this re resistance as well or reluctance as well to talk about, um, to talk about the positi positivities of Europe. Yeah. Um, and don't want to align with the Conservative Party? Well, I think, first of all, that we absolutely need to call out what, what Cameron's been doing. I mean, essentially, what he's doing is, is trying to sort of strut the stage and, and demonstrate some toughness to his backbench Eurosceptics. And already we can see it's not been successful, and it wouldn't have been difficult to predict that, because we know that for those backbenchers, actually nothing less than withdrawal from the EU is going to be enough. So whatever he'd come back was never going to be good enough. But what he has come back with, I think, is exactly the wrong thing. And, and, you know, to be thinking that the answer to Europe's challenges right now is to absolutely try to stop free movement, or that's what he would have loved to have done, but what he is doing, of course, is, is at least restricting the in-work benefits for, for, for migrants. I hate that word, actually, for, for, for Europeans, <laughs> other Europeans who are coming to the UK. Um, and, and then, actually, what's happening, too, which is far less focused on, is the amount of deregulation mm -hmm. as he's demanding now as a, as, as a condition of, of, of staying within the EU. So I think it's right that we absolutely say that that vision of, a, of an EU, an EU that is more fearful, more desperate, more dismal, more dreary, mm -hmm. is not the EU that the majority of people actually want. Mm -hmm. And I think if we could just cut through the media, that is the biggest challenge in my view in the UK in particular, where we mm -hmm. have such a right-wing press and, and it's in the hands of so few media moguls, it's actually really difficult to get a different message across, which is why social media and, and, and other ways of communicating is are so important. But the more that we can talk about how, actually let's just not forget that the EU for a start has been responsible for some of the most progressive mm. um, social legislation in Britain. It's certainly been responsible for some of the best environmental legislation uh, in Europe. And actually for me, as, as somebody who was a member of the European Parliament, I actually found it really moving to to be listening to my colleagues all speaking their different languages and even if we were involved in terribly laborious um, processes <laughs> to try to come, <laughs> which definitely <laughs> happens, but the idea that we are trying to you know, reach agreement through, through talking rather than through bullets and bombs, mm. I think is still quite a moving 
thing. Mm. Um, and perhaps that has less traction for young people today because that's all they've ever known. But I think for perhaps some older people, just reminding them that it isn't that long ago since um, you know, that this was a continent literally tearing itself apart. And that what the EU has been instrumental in doing is making that vision, hopefully, something that you couldn't imagine mm. again. So Europe's soft power, the way in which it's worked with you know, helping democracy and, 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 and uh, freedoms in, in, in other countries, I think, too, is something to, to celebrate. So I think we need to be a bit more on the front foot in terms of saying, yes, there are some things the EU's not done well. Some of that needs to be changed, and that's why mm. we're talking through um, the strategy of DM today. Mm -hmm. Some of it is actually the responsibility of the right-wing governments who currently inhabit most of the key seats yeah. in, in, in the European Union. I think we shouldn't forget that, to some extent, the policies that come out of the EU are dependent on the policies that go in. And when you have a majority right now of, of, uh, of prime ministers and presidents and so forth who come from the right, then it's not very surprising that the agenda of the EU is a deregulatory one. But I remember not that long ago, um, a time when it was the EU15 and there was a, a time when the majority of environment ministers were actually Green Party ministers. Mm. And at that time we had some brilliant policies coming out of the EU. So, you know, our fight as well as making a, a more just and more sustainable EU is also a fight about also making sure that we have governments that are, you know, governing more in the interests of, of ordinary people in all of our countries too. So coming, so coming full, full circle then, also a way to, to, to address questions about why the UK to stay in the, the EU, also very much then must relate to how UK political forces and social movements work together with European partners to stop some of these de deregulatory processes and to, to, to have a common vision of what Europe should be. You. I think you've summed it up. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for, for speaking to me today. It's been really interesting yes, and um, looking forward to the next, the next steps forward of DM. Thank you, me too. <laughs>